Oh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to all attendees um, to the public service uh, session, information session for Churchill Fellowships in 2022. My name is Adam Davey. I'm the CEO of the Winston Churchill Trust. We're based in Canberra, Ngunnawal and Nambri country. And I'm going to begin this information session uh, with an overview of what Churchill Fellowships are all about, how you apply and some of the things we're looking for. Um, and then I'll uh, hand you over to a couple of Churchill Fellows who are going to be speaking about their fellowships and what they've been able to achieve with them. And they'll give you some great insights. Uh, I'd first like to acknowledge uh, Australia's First Nations people, the traditional custodians of the land uh, of Australia. And we're on many different parts of Australia today. Uh, I pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, and welcome any Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander attendees today. And I wanted to let you know, we have a, a very good Indigenous Churchill Fellows network that's really starting to, to build now. And, and that's something that I think um, I'd encourage people to you know, get involved with. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. You'll be able to submit questions uh, via the Q&A function. Uh, if you miss your chance, so we think of questions later, uh, you can contact us directly uh, via our website or you can give us a call or you can attend one of the information sessions coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the very difficult times uh, that we've all gone through over the last couple of years um, with the COVID pandemic, um, and particularly thinking about uh, many of you tuning in today uh, who work across the public sector in, in areas of public service as well. Um, and thank you for all of your hard work. It's, it's been a pretty tough time. So I hope that you're attending this session uh, with a positive mindset and a hopeful uh, outlook for the future. Now, uh, just a bit of uh, history about um, Churchill Fellowships. I'm often asked, uh, where does the money come from? And I think that's, that's a really good question. And a, a little bit of history, I'll answer that for you. So when Sir Winston Churchill resigned as British Prime Minister in 1955, he was 80 years of age. He'd served under five reigning monarchs, survived three uh, wars. He'd been a historian, uh, a journalist, a writer, an adventurer, a painter. Uh, he'd even won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. There was a widespread desire to honour Sir Winston Churchill and capture the essence of his public service, uh, of his inspiration, his intellect, and even his humour. And he wasn't perfect, and you can read some insightful essays on our website that explored Churchill through a contemporary lens. But he was someone who readily believed that anything was possible if you put your mind to it, and that the greatest figures in history were those who made a contribution to public service and their fellow countrymen. So when the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Robert Menzies, announced the news of Sir Winston's death to Australians in January 1965, he also announced a national fundraising event to establish the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust, which is our organisation, uh, to administer Churchill Fellowships. So on Churchill Memorial Sunday, 28th of February 1965, a door-to-door -door appeal was managed and over 220,000 Australians with support from the RSL uh, went out and knocked on doors and together with those generous donations from the public, and from governments and uh, business contributions, uh, more than 2.2 million pounds was raised. So that, that was around $4 million back in 1965. And so that remains one of Australia's largest or most su successful uh, fundraising efforts. And uh, the trust now manages uh, well in excess of $100 million in investments. And we use the proceeds from those investments uh, to pay for the fellowships each year. Uh, in addition to, to those investments, we do receive uh, donations and bequests, um, which help us award more fellowships each year. So other people ask me, you know, what are the attributes of a Churchill Fellow? And you can see on the slide, we've listed some of those attributes. Uh, essentially, Churchill Fellows are the types of people who are passionate and committed to an issue or a topic or, or a field. Um, they want to learn and share that knowledge to benefit uh, their own communities, not just themselves. And so in a nutshell, you know, that's, I think, the attributes of a Churchill Fellow, people that, that don't give up, that just keep pursuing, uh, you know, excellence or improvement. 
So Churchill Fellowship is a unique and prestigious opportunity that's available to Australians from all walks of life. So it's not an academic scholarship. Uh, you don't need to have uh, you know, finished uh, school. You don't need to have a degree to be eligible for a Churchill Fellowship. And it's also not a funding grant. So it's not, not like a grant you apply for and then you have to acquit and go through all the hoops. Um, it's much broader than that and more empowering uh, for the recipient than a grant. It's not just an overseas trip. It's the start of a lifelong journey uh, and contribution to make Australia better. A Churchill Fellowship does not need to comprise formal research. It can, uh, but you can also learn new skills, undertake training courses, build networks, observe best practice uh, in your chosen field. Um, it's an overseas trip that has to be between four and eight weeks uh, taken in one continuous journey. Now, I'll mention some uh, new things we're introducing this year uh, shortly. Uh, we've awarded close to 4,500 Churchill Fellowships since 1965, and each year we typically award over 100 Churchill Fellowships. And uh, they tend to be pretty well spread across states and territories based on, on the population. Churchill Fellows travel the globe on the widest range and depth of topics and bring back to this country information, uh, networks, projects, products, ideas, innovations, things that make uh, our country stronger. In terms of personal eligibility, you have to be an Australian citizen or as of this year, uh, a permanent resident of Australia is also eligible. You need to be 18 years of age. We don't have an upper age limit. And in fact, we do receive and award Churchill Fellowships to you know, people over 60. Um, so, that, so 18 is really the only uh, age limit there. Uh, we now offer virtual research options for pe people who can't travel, perhaps due to a disability or a caring responsibility. So that virtual research would mean something like this, using Zoom or a similar technology uh, to talk to people and to undertake your research. And for people who might live in a remote part of Australia, we're going to be allowing domestic travel soon. Um, so if that's you or you know someone who wants to apply and they do live in a remote part of Australia, please get in touch with us to discuss the options there because um, we do appreciate that in some circumstances, domestic travel may yield more benefits and be more achievable than overseas travel, particularly if you're in a remote area. A Churchill Fellowship is an individual project. So it's not a team project. You can't apply as a team. Uh, there can only be one Churchill Fellow for the project. So keep that in mind. Um, you can take someone with you uh, if it's appropriate. So uh, one good example that I refer to is a 2017 Churchill Fellow from Victoria was researching uh, Indigenous uh, cultural burning techniques and, and his employer uh, paid for an Indigenous employee to uh, attend the meetings overseas with him. And that went actually really well and made a lot of sense. Uh, and they come back and, and certainly done some joint presentations on, on what they found. Um, so it may be appropriate to take someone. Also, you, you might um, have a carer, um, in which case we can also work something out there in terms of your carer accompanying you. If you're undertaking tertiary studies, uh, that's perfectly fine. A lot of people will be in that situation. However, your proposed project can't directly relate to and form part of that study. Um, we expect you to commit 100% to the Churchill Fellowship. That's a, you know, a, a project in and of itself. Um, and when you return, you have an obligation to produce a report and an expectation to share your findings and to uh, work towards implementing you know, change or, or new programs or order, whatever it is um, your fellowship is, is intending to do. Uh, so ultimately, I really want you to hear that a Churchill Fellowship is an opportunity for people from all walks of life. And that's a phrase that gets bandied around, but for us, it is an ethos and we really do mean it. In terms of uh, your project, your proposed project, if you're applying, uh, it has to be suitable for a fellowship, which means um, it's got to benefit the community in some way by you coming back and sharing that, that knowledge or that information or those practices or those skills. Uh, you must demonstrate that you fully explore the topic within Australia to be considered. So we don't want to pay uh, to send you overseas on a fact-finding learning mission when you could have already learnt that in another state in Australia. 
So we, we need you to make sure that you've really covered the topic well in Australia first. It has to be a self-contained project. So I mentioned before, it can't be part of a university degree. It also can't be partly funded by another organisation. Um, so that has to be a, a, a standalone project that is your church or fellowship. Um, we're not an external travel uh, budget department. Um, we, we are a church or fellowship provider. Um, it doesn't need to relate to your employment, but it can, and quite often it does. Um, and that, that's perfectly fine. Um, you might want to talk to your employer about your application. Uh, you know, quite often employees are open to providing paid leave for their employees to undertake a church or fellowship when it relates to their work because they can see the direct benefit um, in the person returning and, and sharing that knowledge. So we don't set limits on the topics or the issues and that's I think quite unique. Um, whatever the topic or issue is, uh, it's highly likely that we will consider it um, for a church or fellowship if you can put forward a compelling case. So you really do uh, design your own project. I said before, it's not a grant. Uh, we don't tell you how to do it. You tell us how you're gonna do it. And then we'll trust you and fund you to go overseas and undertake your project uh, you know, with appropriate support um, to ensure that you're safe and, and, and those sorts of things. So if you can think of a suitable topic, there are no limits. Um, we do offer some what we call sponsored uh, church or fellowships and you'll see them uh, on our website. And when you apply, you'll have the opportunity to select one or two that you think align with your topic. So um, for example, uh, there's uh, two WA departments, the Department of Health and the Department of Communities are offering fellowships uh, on areas directly relevant to their work programs and their strategies. There for Western Australians only. Um, there's a Don McKay Churchill Fellowship, uh, which anyone can apply for, and that's uh, for topics that relate to organised crime and, and related issues. Um, if you do select one of those Churchill Fellowships, that just helps us allocate uh, a fellowship to those sponsored fellowships. You'll still be considered for just a general Churchill Fellowship, so don't get too hung up on whether you align to a sponsored fellowship or not. We can always. Um, work that out for ourselves. So when you're framing a project, um, you should ask yourself, how will it be of some benefit to an aspect of the Australian community or to society by you learning more and coming back and sharing that? That's what we want to hear. So you apply online. Applications are open now. Uh, they close at the end or the 28th of, of April. Um, I would recommend getting in and starting your application. You can return to it many, many times as you like until the closing date. Uh, invariably, church fellows tell us that that process of just writing the application helped them really distill their thoughts and, and get really sharp on what they wanted to do. Uh, it is a bit of a challenge because there's a word limit. So you'll need to learn to be succinct and, and precise. So it is uh, competitive, the process. Um, you have to remember you're going to need to convince us to invest in you and your project or your idea. Um, if you can't access the form online, uh, please contact us. I don't want anyone who, who has a, um, a barrier to using an online form that could be a disability or another reason to miss out on applying um, simply because we couldn't provide you an online form that works. We'll work out another way for you. So please contact us. Um, you're going to need two references, someone who can talk about um, your qualities and someone who can talk with um, some sort of expertise and credibility around the topic or the issue of your proposed project. So another top tip there is get on to working out who those referees, referees are going to be early as possible and make sure they're going to be available over the next month or two to provide that reference. And they'll do it online. When you fill out the application form, they'll get a notification, they'll submit it. But invariably, um, we get lots of calls on the closing date every year from people who are panicking because they haven't got their referees. Um, there's not much we can do about it at that point. Um, so I'd recommend getting in early and lining them up. Uh, so the form is fully automated. You, you register. Um, each time you log in, you'll get a code emailed to you so that you don't have to remember a password. Um, makes it nice and easy. So don't leave your application to the last minute because it won't be your best work. And, you know, we do get, um, you know, somewhere in the order of 1,100 applications in a typical year, and we award around 100 or so uh, fellowships. So it is highly competitive. Um, so put your best foot forward um, is my advice. 
uh, we will ask you in the application to set out um, an itinerary. So essentially, um, limit your itinerary to destinations that will be most benefit to your project and don't overcrowd them. We're not looking for who can travel to most countries and cities in the shortest amount of time. We're looking for someone that's thought strategically and carefully about who do they want to meet with? Um, what do they want to learn from them? Um, which country do they want to visit? And, and set that out in a logical fashion and explain to us why that is important. Um, so really, you know, you don't need to contact the people you propose to meet with um, before uh, you've been awarded the fellowship, but you do need to have a good idea of who it is you want to meet with and why, or what course it is you want to undertake, um, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, I should mention, of course, um, the impact of COVID. Um, obviously, it's had a massive impact on international travel. We do have um, over 200 Churchill Fellowship recipients who are just starting to travel again now. Um, they haven't been out of travel for the last couple of years. So it's a pretty exciting time for us, a busy time. Um, if you are successful this year, you won't be traveling until early 2023, by which time I would really hope that international travel is a lot uh, more predictable and easier than it is now. So in terms of the uh, selection process, uh, the trust has panels and committees in each state and territory comprising people who are drawn from across a range of fields and sectors. Um, applications will be shortlisted, take into account referee comments and the interviews are held. In the larger states, Victoria and New South Wales, there's a first round interview and more shortlisting than a final round interview. In all the other states, you would just attend um, one interview. The uh, website uh, that we have does contain the selection process and it sets out dates so when interviews um, are going to be held. Um, around half of uh, people who are interviewed are likely to receive a fellowship. So if you get it to get to an interview, that's quite a significant achievement. So you should be happy to make it to an interview and, and then really focus on getting yourself across the line. So the odds are pretty good once you get to that point, but it remains very competitive. Our recommendations from those various committees and panels are then presented to the trust board and decisions will be made in September. We're often asked for tips uh, on the application process. Um, the best tips I can give you is to read and address the selection criteria. Use as little jargon as possible. So I mentioned that we have a range of experts from different uh, fields and industries uh, assessing these applications, but you have to assume that no one with that deep knowledge you have is assessing your application and avoid using acronyms and jargon. Make it really clear so that anyone uh, can understand. So I've said this three times now, it's a very competitive process. Not trying to scare you off, just want you to start the applications early and, and really think about it. Uh, most applications are good, but we can't uh, fund everything. So some people uh, are lucky and, and we get their fellowship on their first application. Other people get it on the second, sometimes the third um, attempt. So that's it from me. Um, contact details are on the slide there. I'm now going to, uh, and we will answer the questions at the end, I should have said earlier. So um, we'll go through these next two uh, presentations and you can post your questions in the Q&A and then at the end, we'll work through them all. Um, so I'd like to now uh, introduce to you uh, Owen Churches. He is a Churchill Fellow who is a statistician with the Department of Education in South Australia. Owen undertook his Churchill Fellowship to explore how to create fairness and accountability in the use of government decision-making algorithms. And before joining the public sector, Owen did his PhD in neuroscience at the University of Cambridge and worked in the pharmaceutical industry and in academia. So he's highly qualified. He's got a pretty good sense of humor. And on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Owen. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Adam. And um, before I begin, um, my name's Owen. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Kaurna people, what we sometimes call the Adelaide Plains. And I pay my respects to Indigenous leaders, past, present and emerging. Thanks so much for tuning in and good luck to all of you. Um, the first thing Adam asked me to talk about was about my motivations. Um, why I had applied. And the motivation um, when I first started thinking about 
doing a Churchill Fellowship was that I'd hit a government role after about 10 years in academia where I'd spent a lot of my career uh, building and defining artificial intelligence. And when I hit government work in 2017, it felt like everyone was talking about AI. Artificial intelligence was amazing. And I thought, this is great for me. I'm in exactly the right place at the right time. But being a statistician, um, I wanted to check that uh, the data I was getting wasn't just sort of idiosyncratic and, and biased to me. I was getting it right. So, um, so I did actually uh, search through all of the parliamentary papers that have been tabled in federal parliament. Um, and in, indeed, there, there was a, a, a huge spike in the, the very year I started working for the government, about a doubling in the proportion of papers that mentioned the phrase artificial intelligence. It went from about 0.2 of a percent to 0.4 in one year, and it had been pretty stable in the decades before then. Um, so my motivation uh, when, when I first started thinking about doing a Churchill Fellowship was to um, kind of uh, fairly grumpily think about how everyone around me was just using artificial intelligence as a sort of a buzzword and a sort of a power phrase and, and wasn't using it well and, and, and wasn't using its true mathematical power. What happened over the sort of three months or so that um, I thought about applying and started writing my application was that I, re I realized the opportunity that the Churchill Fellowship would afford me um, could let me think about the role of artificial intelligence in government in a much more expansive um, and more socially important way, something that was much bigger than just the sort of uh, grumpy academic uh, interest that, that I had sort of started with. I started reading uh, a lot about the social effects of, uh, of automated decision making, um, how it affects uh, the people who are, who are impacted, who can't appeal against AI decisions. I started reading about uh, people who work in um, public facing agencies in government around the world who are compelled to use artificial intelligence as part of their decision making and how it impacts uh, their, their feeling of, of, of labor, of, of how they do their jobs. And I started to realize that this is a much bigger and more nuanced and more complicated and far more political and socially important topic than I had ever conceived of. So by the time I actually um, went to do the fellowship, um, I had this huge list of, of people that, that I wanted to, to, to talk to. And, um, the way I ended up fitting lots of different people into my, my six week itinerary was that I, I did set up a, a bunch of really headline uh, interviews with some, some key people in, in government, as well as in business, um, because a, a lot of the innovations that I was interested in were actually happening outside of, of government. And, and I sort of saw that they were the future of where government was going. Um, but I also spend a lot of time uh, just dropping into attending um, local uh, events. The, the possibility of, of platforms like Eventbrite and, and Meetup give you this opportunity to um, uh, find out what's going on um, in other cities um, and uh, go along to events and, and meet people um, who, who um, may be organizing fairly formal sort of settings with uh, a panel and, and speakers and, and they're great opportunities to meet people off to the side um, of those events. But not every one of your interviews and, and your, not every one of your meetings can be with a cabinet minister or a department chief executive and nor should they be because the sort of um, uh, information you get um, when you meet with people like on the ground, people who are just like you, people who are doing your job but in another jurisdiction, um, that's incredibly rich and rewarding at the time, but also into the future, um, because I'm pretty sure all the sort of really uh, senior uh, people I met with forgot me as, as soon as I left their office. But I, I continue to stay in touch with some of the people I met during my Churchill Fellowship that, that I just, found an opportunity to hang out with for a little while. Um, 
make a lot of notes and, and learn from in a, in a more um, relaxed sort of setting. So um, make the most of those sorts of situations if you can as well. Um, Adam asked me to talk a little bit about um, the, the ups and downs, the highlights and, and some of the, the unexpected surprises along the way. Um, I was genuinely surprised by how uh, generous everyone was with their time. Um, uh, I think if you put in the effort um, to get in touch with people um, and, uh, and know about them and what they're doing, um, then, I mean, that's a pretty delightful thing for people to um, be, a, be approached as a, as a source of expertise. So, um, so don't be shy. Um, people uh, are delighted to <laughs> um, share their opinions. Um, I should say I, I, I was surprised um, by the impact of something I sort of did sort of parallel with my actual uh, meetings and, and fellowships. I actually spent quite a bit of time just visiting some places um, around Britain um, that were uh, important to 20th century uh, statistics. And I think they were affecting to me because um, I, I'd, I'd realized before the fellowship, but it really sort of brought home to me while I was in England doing the fellowship that a lot of my sort of um, intellectual sort of ancestors, um, the British academics who sort of invented what we, we now call modern statistics were really motivated by um, a whole bunch of things that are like quite abhorrent now. The, the movement known as eugenics, um, which is the ideology that uh, white people are um, superior um, on earth is really something that um, defined a lot of the, the people who um, built modern statistics. And so coming to terms with that sort of history of the, the maths that's still um, part of what I use on a daily basis was uh, confronting and, um, and important. So yeah, going to visit the, um, the lecture theatres um, and the graves of some of these people and to try and understand how I could do better uh, than my ancestors was, um, was important. Um, after I got home, um, I really uh, worked very hard. I actually, I think I, I realized um, it was important to sort of um, really step it up a gear. Um, Churchill Fellowship was an amazing opportunity and, and, and if it had all sort of just sat with me, um, that would have been still useful, I think. I still would have been a, a better government statistician as a result. But um, I, I kind of um, did everything I could, especially in that first six months to um, get out, get noticed and, and get uh, a lot of what I'd learned um, understood by as broad an audience as, as possible. Um, especially because I, I started to think that maybe um, uh, artificial intelligence in government was just getting to be a, a bigger and bigger thing um, every, every month. Um, I, I've built a few sort of enduring um, structures as well that I think um, is maybe the most useful thing um, I, I could have done. Uh, the, the best is a, a group that can, continues now two and a half years later, um, which is a monthly book club um, that reads uh, AI ethics books um, and discusses them. And, and the book club has now attracted not just uh, uh, software developers and, and statisticians, but a lot of uh, lawyers um, and people interested in um, uh, social impacts of, of technology uh, from a whole bunch of different perspectives. And uh, meeting those people uh, ha has just been um, incredibly valuable to me um, to understand that I'm not carrying the sort of the weight of the, the social change that's needed to um, properly contextualize and regulate AI uh, on my own. Um, the, the thing I, I guess I'm still motivated by is the, the fact that um, government is still talking a lot about AI and, and as evidence of that, um, I would just leave you with the note that um, in, in the subsequent four years, um, we've gone from 0.4% uh, of papers tabled in Australian Parliament mentioning artificial intelligence 
uh, to about 1.7% of all tabled papers, that's about one in every 70 papers that are tabled in the Australian Parliament mention the phrase artificial intelligence, um, which is pretty remarkable. These are papers um, on all sorts of different topics. So it's something that's not going away. Um, and I'm keen to make sure um, that it continues to grow, but grow in a, a safe and responsible and, and healthy way for Australia. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Owen. Uh, I bet we're all uh, feeling pretty glad that Owen's in the job there. It's uh, reassuring. So um, as I said, we'll hold the questions over to the end. We've got quite a few um, banking up there. Um, and I'm sure some of you will have some questions for Owen. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker now, Andrea Lux. Andrea was awarded her fellowship in 2018, actually in the Northern Territory. So I think that's important to mention because we do award fellowships uh, in every state and territory uh, and also Norfolk Island. Um, Andrea's fellowship was to investigate overseas practices of monitoring places of detention. And uh, she's now head of policy communications and strategy at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service based in Melbourne. She's also a PhD candidate. Um, she tells us her PhD was actually inspired by her Churchill Fellowship, and that's how we like it. Um, so building on, on that uh, fellowship research. Uh, she's also a member of Liberty Victoria's Policy Committee, and Andrea is on two Law Institute of Victoria committees, Administrative Law and Human Rights and Reconciliation and Advancement Committees. And in her spare time, she helps us out with things like these presentations. So on that note, I'll hand over to Andrea. Thanks, Adam. Um, and thanks for inviting me to speak about my fellowship today. Um, kind of listening to Owen speak, the word passion comes up over and over again, and you'll hear plenty about that from me as well. Um, I want to start off also to by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians and elders past, present and future of Wurundjeri country where I'm zooming in from today um, and also acknowledge um, uh, and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people um, joining this information session. I really do hope that um, if there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today that you'll consider um, applying for, for the fellowship. And I'm always um, open to people reaching out to me if they want to discuss uh, the fellowship further um, offline. Um, so as Adam has said, I'm currently working in Victoria, but uh, when I applied for the fellowship, I was based in the Northern Territory, had worked for a number of years at the Aboriginal Legal Service up there, the North Australian Aboriginal um, uh, Justice Agency, I'm sure you're all kind of well aware of the Royal Commission uh, that we had in the NT following the Four Corners um, damning report on what was happening in Dondale Youth Detention Centre. And I've always had uh, a passion and an interest in um, protecting the rights of detained people, um, whether that's in a prison setting or in police custody. Um, in the past, I've also spent about, I think it was six or seven years volunteering as a humanitarian observer with Australian Red Cross visiting um, immigration facil detention facilities, Christmas Island, Curtin, um, Nauru and Manus. And when I um, saw this opportunity to, to delve into this a little bit more and make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are sort of really the focus of um, uh, the implementation of OPCAT, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more shortly. I really wanted to, to ensure that I used my experience and, and my, my passion and my kind of commitment to this area to ensure that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people weren't left behind. So OPCAT um, is a UN instrument uh, called the Optional Protocol to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Australia voluntarily ratified this instrument, which means that it promised to um, meet the obligations under the protocol. 
And that included setting up um, a really just robust independent detention oversight mechanism all across Australia. So it would be able to undertake visits to places of detention with a view to prevent the torture and ill treatment of detained people. Um, as we all know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are um, massively overrepresented in, in Australia's prisons and have had a unique history um, and experience within the legal system in Australia. We have a very violent colonial history um, with stolen generations, with genocide, um, dispossession of land. And so coming across, you know, against that history, we now have um, hyper-incarceration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I really wanted to make sure that when it came to implementing OPCAT in Australia, and I was specifically focusing on the NT, um, that those protections would be really um, robust for, for Aboriginal people as well, recognising, you know, the unique history, but also um, unique culture and connections to, to country as well. So in choosing where to go, um, I think this is a really critical part of the application process. Um, you can see sort of the organisations that I met with um, sort of to the right there of the screen, but just make sure you do your research and really think about why these countries, who do you want to meet with those countries and do you want to participate in any activities other than meetings? That last question was really critical for my fellowship. Um, I wanted to meet with existing bodies that were already conducting detention visits, um, but I didn't want to just have meetings. I wanted to try to have an opportunity to shadow their inspections, so, so to, to go with them into prisons, police custody, youth detention facilities. Um, and of course, the reason for that is people can tell you about what they're doing, but nothing can really beat actually being there and, and experiencing it for yourself. So that was um, really the most invaluable part of, of the fellowship for me. So something to think about, um, don't limit yourself just to trainings or, or meetings. There's potentially much more that you can do. Um, also reaching out as early as possible. Um, I actually started reaching out to people before I even applied for the fellowship. I know that that's not necessary, but I found it useful to get a sense of whether it would be something that's really a feasible um, option. And also started thinking about potential barriers. For me, um, it's, I know it's very specific, but obviously to get access um, to prisons um, and youth detention facilities, there's various clearances that you need to undertake. And sometimes all these bureaucratic things can take some time. So kind of did a bit of research around that to see whether that might be feasible and also whether these organisations might be willing to kind of go that extra step. And I was very lucky that they were. Um, be flexible. You don't know what you don't know. Um, I had some preconceptions around what my findings and recommendations might be. Um, having worked in the space and volunteered in the space for some time, but um, where I ended in my recommendations was different to what I had anticipated. Um, and so I think just be really open. Um, if you are successful in your application, you already have some knowledge of the space, um, but just be open to, to learning new things. And I actually um, had some funds that allowed some flexibility to add Switzerland, which I, I wasn't initially going to go to Switzerland, but I wanted to, to visit um, some of the organizations there to kind of run my ideas past them because I was, um, I kind of landed on proposing quite a unique model that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So I wanted to get their, um, their feedback. So if possible, um, see if you can Keep a little bit of your funds there just in case um, you decide there might be an opportunity to or a need to, to go to another country or, or city. Um, why be a Churchill Fellow? Um, Adam and Owen have already spoken about this, but really at the heart of it, you want to make a contribution. Um, you have an area of passion. You see that there's 
you know, there's a gap, there's some missed opportunities and you really want to um, do some work towards addressing that. Um, you also, of course, get to build more expertise in the area that you're passionate about um, and also build a national and international network of like-minded people, um, which Owen has spoken to. I um, can't say I started a book club, but you have got me thinking. So there you go. You keep learning from your fellow fellows, even years later. Um, and then also challenge your own preconceptions. Um, and that can be, you know, a range of different things. Um, as I said, I had some ideas of what my recommendations would be. Um, and I changed my mind as I, as I learnt more along the way. Um, and I think that's always a really valuable um, an interesting thing for anyone who enjoys um, kind of learning and broadening their horizons as well. Um, I've also included a couple of photos there. Um, there's some incidental perks of, of being a Churchill Fellow. You can see that absolutely stunning photo of the Yukon in Canada. I was coming from the tropics straight into the snow. Um, I'm not someone who spent time in cold climates and it felt really special to be able to go there and to a really remote area um, with quite a high um, uh, First Nations population and so it kind of felt strangely like a very very cold NT um, but that's a really special part of the world I probably wouldn't have gotten to go to um, otherwise and then also you have opportunities to um, attend cultural events um, I spent my spare time in galleries and museums and learning more about the, the history of the uh, Indigenous peoples of the countries I visited. Um, and also, um, I suppose, looking at old prisons and, and getting a bit more of a sense of the place as well, which is has some um, similarities with what Owen's spoken about today as well. Um, so since returning to Australia, I've um, started at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service and um, I can't emphasise how much I have used this report in my work. Um, I refer to it very regularly in my own policy work, in our comms work. It's a policy piece that I can share with stakeholders um, working in this space, whether that's government departments or independent statutory bodies, um, other community legal centres, um, other Aboriginal community controlled organisations. So it's this policy piece that um, is kind of available to everyone to use in their own advocacy or learning um, and then hopefully policy development as well. Um, so you can see a couple of the things that we've done at VALS that were kind of springing from, from this fellowship. We um, had a webinar, Unlocking Victorian Justice, that really focused on OPCAT. And you can see um, there's some little bubbles with some of the experts that I met overseas who um, participated on that, um, that webinar. Uh, we've produced uh, fact sheets. Uh, so that's the first page there on the right hand um, corner of that slide. And then we just use um, the, the work in that report as well for a myriad of uh, submissions as well. Um, and then as uh, Adam said, I also identified a gap um, during my fellowship and that's propelled me to then start on my own PhD. So I've done it the opposite way around to Owen. He came with a PhD and I was inspired by my fellowship to do a PhD. So you kind of never know what where you might end up because of the fellowship. Um, mm -hmm. This was not on my to-do list prior to, um, to my travels. Um, and then I guess some tips for preparing your application. It's really trying to demonstrate I think why your research is important and unique so identifying that gap in knowledge and having a really clear strategy around how you're going to answer that question um, because you will be asked by um, the board to you know those sorts of questions um, making it clear that you can't find the answers in Australia and you really do need to go um, overseas and then also um, making it um, also clear that it's 
a feasible uh, project as well. Um, and then having a plan on how to disseminate your findings and recommendations, so really maximising your impact. So upon my return, I had lots of meetings, um, primarily in the NT, but also across Australia, because those, those findings and recs were also um, uh, had value um, and were applicable in other jurisdictions as well. And I've included um, a, a screenshot of one of the pages from my report. You'll see it's in, um, I translated with the support of, of the fellowship and I'm really grateful for um, their support in this. I translated my executive sum summary into a Yongu language, um, which is um, there's dialects spoken in Arnhem Land in the NT. And I guess I really wanted to practice what I was preaching in the report and um, ensuring that the information was accessible to the people who are most impacted um, by whatever policy might end up being developed. So that was, I think, also very important to me. So that's something to keep in mind that the fellowship um, is open to new ways of doing things um, as well. So I think that's, that's pretty special. Um, what did the fellowship mean for me? It was a career changing experience. Um, I developed skills and knowledge that I use on a weekly basis. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and I've kind of already spoken to how um, it's, it's been a really useful platform to do consultations and to, to develop policy positions and kind of advocate for culturally appropriate implementation of this torture prevention protocol. So really making sure that it can have that um, objective met in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and then, yeah, as I've already said, I keep coming back to the report on a regular basis and now I've embarked on this PhD as well. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Awesome, thanks so much, Andrea. That was, that was wonderful and, I, and you gave some uh, really good information there that I think goes some way to answering some of the questions that um, we have. So I'll now I'm going to go through the, the questions that we have uh, received already and I'll just rip through them as efficiently as I can to make sure we've got time for any other ones that come up. So uh, the first question is uh, wanting to confirm when I said that your fellowship project can't relate to and form part of tertiary studies, can I clarify this person's topic is inspired by their masters they're studying, but their uh, fellowship, if they were successful, wouldn't happen until after they've completed their last unit. So I think, well, well done. I think you've answered your question there um, because you will have finished your, your tertiary studies, so it can't form part of it. So just to clarify, you know, if you're currently undertaking tertiary studies, then we don't want your fellowship to become part of that. But if you've completed it, uh, that's, that's fine. And as you heard from um, Andrea, she's been inspired to go on to undertake a PhD. Now, I'd also like to say there's no expectations on behalf of uh, the trust that all our church fellows uh, undertake PhDs. That's um, some of them do, which is awesome, uh, but certainly we don't expect that. So the next question, uh, in terms of knowing who to meet with, um, is it sufficient to identify the organisation you want to meet with? For example, I want to go to the UK, to London, to meet with the City Council. Absolutely, that's fine. That's a great level of um, detail. We'll also want you to say, uh, you know, broadly speaking, what you want to do there. So you might say uh, to conduct interviews or it might be to observe a particular thing they do there. Um, you just need to think about what, what do you want to do, meetings, et cetera. Uh, it might be undertaking a course. So um, that's the kind of detail we want. Um, do we uh, require referees to be Australian or based in Australia? Uh, look, we prefer it um, for contextual reasons. It makes sense. But uh, in some cases, uh, I think it's, it's reasonable if you've got a referee who uh, is an expert in your field um, and there's no one in Australia that can take on that role, then that's acceptable to use uh, an overseas uh, reference. How have previous fellows from the public service or sector um, shared their findings in the past? Well, um, look in lots of different ways. Um, uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, you know, a report and, and she went a little bit extra there having it um, translated. 
We've had fellows do podcasts. Uh, we've had fellows create websites, present at conferences. Some fellows have gone on to set up not-for-profit organisations. They do media interviews, uh, you know, issue their own media releases, uh, do radio interviews, uh, all sorts of things. Um, really, the sky is the limit. Um, we will ask you in the application, um, how do you propose to share the, the information and knowledge? Uh, there will be some limitations for some of you if you work in a um, federal or state uh, government department. There may be things that you feel you, you can't uh, take a personal position on. I think you need to have a conversation with your employer uh, before you apply to get a sense of where those boundaries might sit. Um, I also will acknowledge that there are some people that work in areas that might cover things like national security, which, and you'll be saying, well, I can't, I can't publish this information. Well, that's okay. That does happen as well. And um, we can make some exceptions. Uh, you'll still obviously be required to uh, write a report or, or something, but um, you know, you might not be able to publish it and that's, that's fine. Uh, in those cases, your way of sharing that knowledge will be within um, that particular um, sector or within those agencies. Um, are there limitations? A good question on destinations. Yes, absolutely. So we use Smart Traveller as the guide. So we won't let you travel to countries uh, that are considered dangerous and, and you know, DFAT um, recommends you don't go to. Uh, you do have insurance provided by the trust to cover you on your, your travels. Um, but absolutely, the smart traveller is, is the guideline that we do provide. Um, if successful and there's a risk of border closures, yep, certainly currently the case, um, at the desired time of travel, is it possible to defer the travel to a later date? Yes, absolutely. So um, we give everyone a 12 month window to travel. As I mentioned earlier, we've got two years worth of fellows who haven't been out of travel and we've had to defer it. So I think while um, it's, it's challenging and risky um, to travel, we're happy to defer it. But anyone applying this year, you won't be traveling until 2023 and, and hopefully it's much uh, easier then. Uh, another question, if you're doing research or interviewing people, is there an ethics process? Not from us. Um, it's usually people who work at universities um, to be honest, academic researchers raise this question all the time, and that's something for you to manage. Uh, we don't impose an ethics process. We do recommend, obviously, that um, if you're, uh, you know, wanting to, to quote people or use their photos, that you, you ask permission, that sort of things. But we don't have a, we're, we're not a research organisation. Um, we don't have an ethics process. Um, I know the itinerary is used to calculate budget, but how strict is it after that? Um, so in this example, in the question, um, the person knows they want to go to Scotland and they need to go to uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, but when they go to set up meetings with these people, they might get uh, some serendipitous, uh, unexpected opportunities. Great. So what we say there is in your itinerary, spread it out a bit. So we don't want to see uh, an itinerary in an application that suggests you're going to be just bouncing from city to city to country to country day after day. Factor in some padding. Uh, put some time in there. Andrea talked about, uh, you know, imbibing in the culture, getting to understand the context of where you are. You need to put some fat in there and that will allow you to take up those opportunities that you didn't know about until you got there. So that's one of the, I guess, the freeing freedom aspects of a Churchill Fellowship. You can do that. So you don't need to go back and formally change your itinerary. Just put some space in your itinerary from the start. Um, what kind of evidence do you look for that we fully investigated our topic in Australia? Uh, look, to be honest, it's, it's usually quite um, obvious. Um, you know, all of our assessors will be pretty sharp on Google. And if you say in the application, no one in Australia is doing this, I need to go to um, Europe and um, find out all about it. And, and we Google and see that someone in you know, Queensland is doing it, um, that'll raise some questions and you'll be asked at your interview. So, uh, you will get asked questions, so I think um, it'll be fairly obvious. Um, another question about uh, any former public service applicants and what permissions they sought internally before applying, applying um, so conflict of interest and things like that. Look, it, it's an interesting one and um, it, it varies. It varies depending on the person, it varies depending on the government department or agency they're working for. 
my advice, and look, I spent um, over two decades in federal public service, um, is speak to your department or your organisation um, before you submit your application, try and get a, a sense of how they feel about your topic and you doing the fellowship. It's not uncommon for people to be given study leave or other forms of leave or paid leave or to use a combination of um, you know, personal leave or miscellaneous leave. Um, get, get all those questions on the table before you um, apply and that saves it becoming uh, a stressful uh, discussion to have once you've been awarded the fellowship and you find out that there's not much support. Well, that would be my, my advice there. Um, is there help with media savvy on a fellow's return? Look, yes, yeah, so we do induction training. We have a communication expert come in and help you uh, think about before you even leave on your fellowship. What are your key, uh, you know, who are your key audiences? Who are the key stakeholders? How will you communicate with them? Those sorts of things. And we're constantly building more what we call post-fellowship support. So when you come back, you can access funds to um, assist you with disseminating uh, your findings. We will be doing things like providing media training for fellows where that's appropriate. Uh, so there's a lot more than just the, the fellowship trip to help support you um, with those sorts of things. Uh, what's the word limit on the application? I couldn't tell you what it is um, overall. Um, it's fairly short for each question. So I think just go in, create an application and, and have a look. Um, how detailed does your itinerary need to be? Uh, so I think, you know, basically uh, country, um, town, person or organisation you want to meet with, how many days? And that's, that's pretty much it. So it might be, you know, London, meeting with that council, uh, meeting with another organisation, five days, then moving on to the next city or the next country. Um, that's the level of detail. Um, can you combine face-to-face -face overseas research with virtual discussions? Uh, Yes and no. So look, really the preference is that people go overseas. That's the whole point um, of a church or fellowship. With COVID, we have allowed um, what we, I guess we call kind of hybrid approaches where some people are still finding it, it's too difficult or too stressful to travel overseas at the moment or they can't get meetings in countries where they, they could have, you know, two years ago. And so they're saying, look, I'm going to cut my fellowship down to go to this country and that country and I'll do virtual research to the other two. So we're allowing that. Um, you know, in, in the future, in 2023, I think if it's still a problem, um, we, we could allow that. That said, um, way before we had a pandemic, it wasn't uncommon for people to undertake their physical travel, do their, their research, their meetings. And of course, invariably, oh, they couldn't meet with someone because they just weren't available, the ducks didn't line up, and they do a virtual meeting, a Skype or a Zoom later anyway, and that's just how they did it. So I think, you know, broadly speaking, that that's fine. Um, there's a question here for Owen about his second last slide. Um, uh, perhaps Owen, you might like to answer that one, that question to Cheryl um, using the chat function or turn your camera on and answer it. Um, uh, my camera is disabled. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because of the functionality of the meeting. Um, oh, no, we're on, hello. Uh, sorry, what question are we oh, up to? So the question is, uh, your second last slide talked about the sweet spot between skills and interest, but this person dismissed the uh, third item. So just wondering if you might have that handy or you could type it into that question if you want to. Uh, oh, sure. Um, I think what I meant uh, when I was writing that was just that um, the, it seems like having met other people who have had Churchill Fellowships what works really well is when you have something that is incredibly important to you that, that is about something outside of you, right? It's great if you're really passionate about, you know, um, like if I was just really passionate about writing great algorithms and it ended there, then it wouldn't have been a, a, a worthwhile Churchill Fellowship. It would have just been about me, but about using something that I'm passionate about that's about something out of me, that is how algorithms are impacting people uh, in the world, then that's where it gets meaningful and useful. That's, I think, the sweet spot. Right. Um, and Andrew, feel free to put your camera on if you want to help answer this one. So a question for Owen or Andrew is, how did you pace your itinerary and plan in uh, downtime or reflection time? Maybe Andrea. Sure. I mean, it is 
uh, look, the fellowship was a very busy time. Um, there are some tips that former fellows gave me. So um, I got like a just a free little voice recording app on my phone. And so I would just be in my room or at the airport, you know, long layover and I would record my thoughts and that way it just felt less stressful than having to type it all out or you know write it all out um so I found that really useful um that would probably be my my main tip but I also as I was going along just kind of collated future readings that I wanted to do or, or you know future questions that I kind of wanted to to um follow up on and, but yeah, downtime is really important. Um, and as I said, I really enjoyed going and, and seeing, you know, Marty cultural festivals and um, going to the gallery and seeing like beautiful Anishinaabe art in Canada. Um, yeah, so I, I guess my downtime, I made sure it wasn't just in the hotel room. I took advantage of Yeah, have, of a, have a weekend where I say like, you know, you don't work 24 seven. We don't want you burning out um, overseas, spread it out yourself. Um, thanks, uh, Andrea. Uh, Simone, what a great question. Does the fellowship monitor or evaluate the impacts uh, of the fellowship projects? Um, yeah, great question. Look, we're undertaking some research at the moment as an organisation to help us get a better understanding of, you know, how do you measure or how do you, you know, evaluate the impact, you know, in a more systematic way? Um, absolutely, we follow up with you. Um, after you've done your fellowship, uh, you know, we stay engaged. Um, we will follow up with you uh, at intervals over the, the years after you do your fellowship to find out how things are going. We're in the process of, you know, creating um, great uh, stories, um, of, uh, you know, videos and, and case studies about fellows and what they've achieved. So, um, you know, it's not, we're, we're not taskmasters, um, but we certainly are very interested in, in understanding how uh, our fellowships lead to impact. And this year, we're, we're in the next week, we're going to launch uh, a new thing we, which is called impact funding where we'll offer some funding for fellows to apply for to help them uh, implement their findings so that's pretty exciting so that's, that's a great question and a very important one. Um, Andrew's asked can I submit two proposals? No uh, in short uh, if you're interested in two topics um, you're gonna have to pick one um, if it sits across public service and community or one of those categories that we have uh, eight categories don't worry about that we'll sort out which um, category to put you in um, that's just simply to help us uh, get you in front of the right assessors um, ultimately but I wouldn't get too hung up on which category but you can only submit one um, application. Um, Trina says she has a young family can they travel with me um, with their dad or whoever absolutely so funded of course so that's again a great thing about the church of fellowships if you want to take your family with you um, as long as they're traveling with you they'll also be covered by the insurance that we provide the travel insurance um, you can meet them afterwards and at your expense extend your time away uh, turn it into a holiday at the end that's perfectly fine those of you who work in the public service will be relieved to hear that um, and of course some people don't like to take their family they like to escape um, and that's fine as well um, Angus, uh, have you had many or any fellowships in a business context? Uh, a context, like improving business skills, knowledge. Absolutely, yes. And look, I would certainly encourage applications um, in, in the business context, please. So, perfectly fine. And, and I think some people ask, well, I might benefit, you know, financially, personally from what I learn, and yeah, that's cool. Um, but you also need to share that knowledge. So as long as you don't come back and keep it yourself, if you can share that and benefit, well, that's perfectly uh, fine by us. Uh, can the project be tertiary study adjacent? So someone's currently undertaking a PhD, has an idea for a project not related. Look, that, that's fine. Um, the question will come up, how are you going to commit your time to a church or fellowship when you're doing something that already will be, you know, committing a lot of your time? So I think that balance, that'll be important. I think it's going to be very difficult to give you all to a church or fellowship because it's not just the trip. It's when you come back, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. We want to see you uh, generate some impact and, and implement and share um, your knowledge. So um, if you can do that and the PhD at the same time, you're pretty special, but, um, you know, you can try and convince us. Uh, can you visit two or three countries which are centres of expertise in the relevant field? Um, if you break an itinerary between them in the one trip? Yes, you can. 
Um, in the application form under employment, the job title of other is not listed. Uh, this person is an elected member, um, can't find other. Yeah, good question. Look, at the end of the day, that doesn't go into your assessment. It's really for us to get a good understanding of where people are applying from. So we're making sure that we are uh, getting applications from all walks of life, all fields. Um, so uh, I think just pick one that's close. Um, but we'll I'll follow up and see if there's meant to be a, an other option there or not. Um, but again, I wouldn't get too stressed about that one. Um, does the fellowship cover your expenses overseas other than accommodation? Yes, absolutely. So if you're a successful, you get your airfares covered, your you know, internal travel, your insurance. And then what we do is we calculate based on at the time um, of your fellowship being awarded, the uh, travel, international travel rates, uh, exchange rates, et cetera. And you'll get an allowance for accommodation and food. We pay that to you. You book your accommodation um, wherever you want. You, you know, you organize that yourself. So we don't book your um, accommodation. The travel has to be booked through a central travel agency um, that we have. And that makes it much safer and easier for if things go wrong or there's a pandemic or whatever. Um, but you are free to book your own accommodation. Some people use Airbnb. Some people stay with friends or family. We don't then take that money off you. That's um, up to you uh, to, to manage your budget as you will. Uh, some people upgrade their accommodation to a level that's probably beyond what we pay, but the amount is quite generous. Uh, following on from the last question, uh, is there a scope on what is a reasonable degree of funding? Well, look, it's, it's we fund what, what it, um, we think it costs to do it based on real figures. Um, so it's not really up to you to worry about that. Um, I think because it's between four to eight weeks, most people end up with an around the world ticket. It's just more economical that way. Um, you know, the costs, uh, we know they're fairly contained by that um, eight week upper limit anyway. Uh, we do uh, allow you to apply for some additional funding for maybe uh, a, a conference or a course or something like that. Um, and there's guidance in the application on, on, on in relation to that. If there's a course that really is the main focus of your fellowship. So for example, we have someone from South Australia who is going uh, to Italy, uh, specifically do a course in Italian patisserie. Um, it's not really cheap, but they're not, that's the focus. They're not going around the world to do a lot of other things. Um, maybe give us a call and talk about that in the first instance. Um, but certainly, you know, we can cover a course if that's the, the main purpose of your fellowship. Um, how targeted does your topic need to be? And are you able to refine it through the course of the fellowship? So I guess, um, you know, your, your proposed project needs to be quite specific, but of course, um, you don't always know what you don't know. So, you, you know, you might find, and this is not uncommon, that through the course of your fellowship travels and meeting with people, you know, you're discovering new things and, and you kind of refine it as you go. And that's, that's natural and that's fine. And so you, you would articulate that in your report, whether that's a written report or a podcast or a video, whatever it is you end up doing, um, that's fine. But you do need to have a very clear idea of um, what it is that you want to go and find out about and why. Um, that's really important. So um, I think we may have come to the end of all the, uh, the questions and we certainly run over, over time. So we have recorded um, these presentations. Once uh, all of our uh, online sessions are finished over the next few weeks, we'll make these available. Uh, as I said at the start, feel free to attend another one if you want to. Feel free to give us a call at the office um, or send an email and always happy to answer your questions. So thanks for attending tonight. Good luck with your applications and uh, have a good night.